Bless us, Lord, as we preach the word of God today. May we do no damage to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to preach today from this subject, the place of meaning. The place of meaning. M-E-A-N-I-N-G. Meaning. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than than I, the place of meaning. Would you say amen? Last time, this past Thursday night, and I didn't know that the Lord would give me at the time um, two messages with similar topics and even from the same book, to be honest with you, saints, unless the Lord have, has me in a series, I don't know what I'm going to preach. I turn to him, and I ask him. And I've had this relationship with the Lord uh, for so long that I know when I have heard his voice. And then he, because you see, he knows what you need. I don't. Amen. Amen. I'm, I'm fascinated by pastors who can plan out their sermons a year in advance. I'm like, man. God just didn't give it to me that way. He gives it to me sometimes a day in advance. <laughs> Amen. But however, it's the Lord. And uh, this past Thursday night, we preached from Psalms 133, and the subject was the place of blessings. The third verse of Psalms 133 in the B clause, the Bible says, for there, the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. The blessing of which the psalmist uh, spoke of or speaks of is benediction. That blessing is favor. It is benefit. It is happiness. The Hebrew word is barakah. And the place of blessing, we're told, in verse 1 of Psalms 133, that place is, it's not a physical destination, it's when the saints are unified. Oneness in the believer is where God commanded the blessing. Amen. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren, the Bible says, to dwell together in unity. Brethren, a particular group, to dwell together and to learn not just to get unified uh, once, but to learn how to live there, consistently being with one accord. When we reach a place of unity, and this is transferable, it's true in a marriage, it's true in a business, it's true in an office, it's true uh, on a team, when, when you get unified. When, when you're thinking together, one of the, one of the greatest uh, challenges of marriage is uh, harmony. You got two people who are different. You have to learn to think alike. You won't, you won't share the same st thoughts all the time, but the norm ought to be agreement, not disagreement. If you're disagreeing all the time, you're in trouble. This is one of the reasons why when you date, you should date, uh, this, I said this is one of the reasons. You should date, not the only reason, you, but one of the reasons, you should date fornication free. See, because the sex is going to blind you. Once that element is introduced, into your dating. Once it is introduced, it shuts down everything else. 
your whole relationship becomes a, a relationship of cat and mouse. You play around until you can have sex again. You tolerate everything else until you can have sex again. You sit there and wait for mom and dad to fall asleep. And they're dumb enough to fall asleep with him in the house. Crystal and John were dating when I got sleepy. It was time for him to leave. Right. Well, I'm tired now. I'm going to bed. That's the cue. <laughs> doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if you're in the in, in the midst of in the middle of your sentence. You're not you're not, you're not even going to finish it. It's time to leave because the man of the house is going to bed. And ain't no two men of the house. So, amen. Ain't no two men. Me. Man of the house. And it worked too. Yes, sir. Yeah, it blinds you. And so you don't learn that individual. You don't, you don't get a chance to learn what you have in common. Your areas of agreement or disagreement. Likes or dislikes. And, but, but it's amazing how sex don't have the power to blind all that, though, to hide all that after you get married. After you get married, all those things kill the sex. Don't touch me. It's amazing how it reverses. You young couples who are dating and you're on your way to the altar, Take what I'm saying and live by it, and it will bless you. Some of the older couples who didn't listen, they'll tell you. If they ever get a chance to talk to you privately, uh, he's a preacher. He, I can't tell you why, but what he's telling you is so. I, I don't want to go into any details, but what the man of God said, listen to him. Because it's a different story than you sitting there looking at that man or uh, he's looking at that woman and saying, well, who is this I married? Who you married? <laughs> Same person. But now you're seeing what God um, wanted you to see. Uh, and he, he would show you that it may not mean the person's not a good person. It may not mean they're not a godly person. It just may not be the right person for you. If there, not, if, there, if there are not enough areas of agreement, who wants to live their whole life fussing and arguing every day, going back and forth? Oh, my God. That's cruel and unusual punishment. And, and there are no guarantees, but you greatly increase your chances by doing it God's way. Well, when any group get with one accord, we get back to this, good things happen. And the longer you're walking in agreement and in harmony, the greater the blessings will be. Psalms 133 speaks of what is called God's particularistic blessings. That is, God sets his covenant love upon a certain people in a certain place, at a certain time, in a special way, for a special purpose. And as they work together and let the Lord use them, whether it's the happy, mar happy warriors to save unborn babies, love life, our church, praise the Lord, certain people for a certain group, anointed, called out to do a specific work. Amen. And then the challenge, the task of each member of the group is to exercise that same love, that same covenantal love toward each other. See, we're doing the work of the Lord, but we can't, we can't fail, we can't forget that God has called us to love each other in a covenantal way. For we're in the covenant. We, are, we make up the body of Christ. We are members of a local congregation. We are Americans. We, there are so many things that we have in common that distinguish us. 
So the Bible says, when brethren dwell together in unity, it says unity, agreement, oneness. That's the place. That's the place. Uh, uh, the third verse says, there God commanded the blessing. Well, today in our text, and we're preaching about the place of meaning, we're not talking about a particular group. But we're dealing with the plight of an individual. The king, David himself. And in Psalm 61 in our text, we find him in a very vulnerable place. Most theologians agree that this particular psalm does not correspond with any particular event that is recorded in scripture uh, that covers David's life. But uh, it was a time when he was standing, if you will, on shaky ground. He's in a place that we've all, we all have been in before, or we will be in at some point. Or there are some today who may currently be where David was. If you live long enough, what happened to him to throw him into this state of panic will happen to you. Life happens to all. Amen. And if you're going through a time in your life where it is a good season, celebrate it. But don't assume that it will always be like it is now. And if you're going through a time where it's a bad season, learn from it. God bless you, Elder Johnson. Good to see you today. Learn from it because, listen to me, the bad season won't last forever. If you trust the Lord, the Lord will turn it around. One of the greatest blessings that um, Joseph gave to Pharaoh in interpreting the dream um, was to let him know that seven years of famine would accompany the seven years of plenty. It's easy to assume if you've had two, three, four, five years in a row of a of, of bumper crop, uh, everything going your way, it's easy to assume that that is the way that it will be for the rest of your life. It's easy. It's almost like some athletes, when they make it big and they get that first big contract, they spend the money, they spend money, many of them, as though they will always be able to play. They don't save, they don't put any money back, they don't put anything aside, they just spend it. They go out to the garage and there are 30 cars. And you still can't drive but one at a time. And uh, I, Or they build an extravagant uh, mansion. I was watching a show the other day uh, featuring Evander Holyfield. And um, uh, A-Rod baseball player uh, has started a business where he's helping athletes or people who were famous who fell on hard times get back on their feet. And uh, I don't know if this was the first episode or not, but the episode that I saw, and I saw them advertising six uh, other episodes, he was helping Evander Holyfield. And Holyfield took him to the place where he was living at the time of the filming. I don't know if he lives there now or not. I don't know. And it's a resident, uh, you know, uh, I mean, it was, it was taped this year, so. And when they walked into Holyfield's apartment, A-Rod said, this is a nice place. Holyfield says, but not if you realize where I came from. And they showed pictures of, of that mansion that he built, that huge house. 
a sprawling campus compared now to what appeared to be a little two-room studio apartment. He couldn't see when he built that house in those years of plenty. Hey, man, you might, you might want to prepare. See, because this is not the way it may always be. Are you, are you following me? Joseph said, you're going to have seven years of plenty, but after the seven years of plenty, there are coming seven years of famine. So he said, prepare. Prepare. If you're going through a good season in your life, celebrate it. But you're always prepared. If you're going through a bad season in your life, endure it with hope. Knowing that uh, a change will come. David was in a vulnerable place. And in that vulnerable place, his search, according to Psalms 61, was a search for meaning. Everybody say meaning. 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 His heart was overwhelmed. He was looking for Meaning, the Bible says in Proverbs 4 and verse 7, with all thy getting, get an understanding. The word understanding literally means get, get the meaning of this. It's not just this, this thing that you're contending with, but what does it mean? Um. The intent. Lord, why this? What is the purpose of this thing? Uh, understanding is insight. In the adult world, the why of a thing many times is more important than the what. What it is in our world is not as important as why it is. The what was that the man was born blind. The why was that he might bring glory, that the Lord would use his state of blindness to heal him to bring glory to the God of the Bible. There is the what and there is the why. The, the, the joy of the world of children is that they don't have to know the why of a thing. They eat whatever they want. They eat for taste. When you get grown, man, you should, that, that changes, doesn't it? Oh, Lord, there's a whole lot of things you want to put in you. But all kinds of things come to mind. Diabetes, high blood pressure, low blood pressure, all kinds of things come to mind. Uh, weight, praise the Lord. You name it. Boy, it's bad, isn't it? You want to have seconds and thirds, but... Lifespan starts to kick in. And then not, not to mention, not to mention what happens in the mirror. It's just like, you know, you, you, you get a certain age and your metabolism just quit. I mean, just the other day I went looking for mine. I, man, I was searching high. And Lord, I found, I said, come on back here. Go back to work. And it's working, but it ain't working right. Someone else's metabolism have quit. I'm not the only one. <laughs> Pastor, I'm not in here by myself. Praise the Lord. The, these things happen. And so all of these things in the adult world comes to mind. Don't be an adult and not seek understanding. Adults who do not go beyond what is apparent and go beyond the veil and, and get an understanding and get the deeper meaning and, and try to find out whether or not this is of God or of the devil and all that. Adults who fail to do those things are adults who fall to the trick of the devil. There are adults who end up messing their lives up. 
Satan brings all kinds of presentations your way. You got to ask, what is this? Amen. Got to ask God to give you understanding. If you will, I want to move along a little quicker. It's, now it's getting warm in here. Brother, I guess the, 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 the temperature people are going to be like yo-yos today. See, because if they get too hot, what's they're going to fall asleep on? They're going to say, Brother Preacher, I'm with you, but I'll, I'll catch you the next time. <laughs> I see you. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 20 says, Brethren, be not children in understanding. How be it? In malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. In understanding, in learning the meaning of things, in getting insight, be mature. Can't live like a child when it comes down to understanding the why of a thing. He says, you can be, uh, be not children in understanding. Uh, quickly, Ephesians chapter uh, number one and verse 18 says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Look at this. You see it? The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. In that same book and in the uh, fifth chapter and the 17th verse says, Wherefore be ye not unwise, look at this, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Oh my understanding. Everybody say understanding. Second Timothy, the second uh, chapter and the, uh, the seventh verse says, consider what I say and the Lord will give the understanding in all things. David needed to understand what was going on. Text is about, as I forementioned, David as king, and we have the king praying for himself. He uses what is called throne language. Throne language is when you, uh, you speak of yourself or you pray in the third person. David prays in the third person singular, and he says in verse 6 and 7, Thou will prolong the king's life and his years as many generations. Speaking of himself, he shall abide before God forever. Oh, prepare mercy and truth which may preserve him. Number one, he prays in verse six that the Lord would give him long life. Lord, whatever this is, let me outlive it. And not only does he want long life, but he wants life in the presence of the Lord. Long life, and uh, says uh, his years as generations, he wants to live to see generations come and go, but he also wants to live, in verse 7, in the presence of the Lord. He, he shall abide before God forever. And then he asks God to protect him in the, uh, the seventh verse, and the B clause, he says, he speaks of, preserving him, that is, protect me or God keep me through God's mercy, that is, his covenant love and forgiveness and through God's truth. Truth here is the Lord's faithfulness. He's saying that uh, the Lord is going to keep me because I can depend on the Lord. Oh, I want to tell you today, saints, you can depend on him. Don't give up on God, regardless to how things may look. Don't give up on the Lord, regardless to how long it may take. If he has promised, he will deliver his promise. 
Amen. Don't lose your faith. Be not weary in well-doing, for you shall reap in due season if you faint not. Some people give up on God. They give up on the Lord's ability to heal their bodies. They give up on the Lord's ability to send them a mate. They give up on the Lord's ability and God's promise and many times when they, the manifestation that they've given up is they stop worshiping. They stop attending church. They, they stop praising the Lord. They go back into, they go back to the sins that the Lord brought them out of. They do all kinds of things because they gave up on God. Don't you ever give up on the God of the Bible. Amen. Back to the state of the king. It is apparent that wherever David was, he was far from Jerusalem. He says in verse 1, hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. And he says this, from the ends of the earth will I cry unto thee. From the ends of the earth will I cry unto thee. There's a little spiritual geography here, but the, the, he was not in the presence of God. He was not in Jerusalem where the tabernacle was. He was not in the, near the tabernacle where God was said to dwell. Amen. Have you ever been in a situation where when you prayed, you felt like your prayers were long distance? You're praying, but you don't sense that you're in the presence of God and you're trying to get through. This is where he was. We don't know where he, he were, where he was physically, but he was not in Jerusalem. And he cries out and says, God, from the ends of the earth, I'm calling on you. I'm in a vulnerable place place. Glory to God. I'm calling on you. And we learn his condition in verse 2. He's praying to God with a overwhelmed heart. Overwhelmed. That is, to be overwhelmed is to, be, to become feeble. To be overwhelmed is to become faint. To be weak. It is to become weary and worn out in spirit. Whatever was going on, it was clear that it was, had gotten the better of him. There is a sense of urgency in David's cry because he was overwhelmed by what was happening, and look at this, and he was fainting under the pressure of that thing. Be careful how you talk to people and deal with people and how you assess people when they faint under pressure. Especially if it is a pressure that you've never been under. Praise the Lord. If you haven't been under pressure, you don't know what pressure can do. Pressure can discombobulate you if you let it. You don't hear what I'm saying. Pressure uh, interrupts your, your thinking. You, you can't put two and two together. Two and two comes out to be eight or nine when you're under pressure. Sometimes pressure can cause your whole attitude and disposition to change. I know that when we're going through, we're supposed to behave a certain way. And I understand that the, that the faith teachers teach that if you just walk by faith, you won't ever get overwhelmed. Well, they all say that until they get enough pressure. Everybody, there is something out there that can make any of us uneasy, no matter how strong you may be in the law. Because at the end of the day, we're all human. And we see the mighty psalm, the sweet psalmist of Israel. We see the man who was said to be the apple, according to the scripture, of God's eye. Called the son of David. Jesus was called the son of David. David was overwhelmed. The affairs of running a kingdom. Oh, say what you will or may. The affairs of running a home. The, the, the affairs of being a parent, a marriage, 
working on a job, running a business, trying to get navigate the college campus, trying to get through a collegiate life, 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 physical sicknesses, chronic illnesses, dealing with aging parents, life, tax woes, <laughs> life, life. Things can happen. Unexpected deaths. Expected deaths. You never know how a thing is going to affect you. Betrayals. Praise the Lord. People whom you thought you could trust they found out that you couldn't trust them. That, these things can overwhelm you. They can make you grow faint. Praise the Lord. We, we live in a tense atmosphere in our country right now. There are things that are going on. And sometimes, sometimes if you're not careful as a believer, just seeing the wickedness that is out there can overwhelm you. That's what got the better of Habakkuk. Right. Habakkuk saw the, 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 the sin of his day. Uh, Habakkuk even called his book the burden of the Lord. The book of Habakkuk is called a burden and he complained to God about the wickedness of society and he accused the Lord of doing nothing about it. He wasn't ready for God's answer but the point is that his, what he saw got the better of him. You know, it, 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 it just moves you. Oh, uh, listen, I remember, I, I remember as a child, I, I remember this time of the year, especially after Thanksgiving. I remember going into stores. We had no money, but we went into the stores, and you see uh, a banner uh, across, across the store, across the ceiling, Merry Christmas. You don't see that anymore. You, political correctness have taken Christ out of Christmas. Political correctness have made Thanksgiving Turkey Day. My God, you, it's almost a death nail to your, to your business if you dare agree with the God of the Bible in public on the definition of marriage. All of a sudden now you are, you are no longer LGBTQ friendly and they're coming after your business. Now, the main thing that I like about Chick-fil-A. It wasn't the taste of the chicken. It wasn't that because the, the, the pickle juice makes it a little bit too salty for me. It was their social stain. Now, all of a sudden, look at the good that the Salvation Army does. Look at the good that some of these other uh, charity groups do and, and the people they bless. And because some punk have de has decided uh, oh, uh, that they are not LGBTQ friendly. That they would challenge them. You know, Mr. Kathy died, the man that started the country. See, some of these children, some of these children, they don't carry on. These uh, trust fund babies. Born in it. Didn't build it. And... Uh, now forsaking what made it great. So now because some wicked person decides that they're not LGBTQ friendly, they're going to come against them. And that now they cave to that pressure. Now, let me tell you what bothers me about that. And I'm going to get back to David. I'm not, I'm not upset uh, with Chick-fil-A. What bothers me is the way the Christians right. will respond right. to what Chick-fil-A did. You'll be in line Monday to get that chicken sandwich. See, because let me tell you something. If we ever use our strength in the marketplace, yeah. see, the, 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 what, what businesses 
since America claims to be 80% Christian, what businesses should be afraid of, be afraid of. is to be called uh, unchristian That's or right. not Christian friendly. That's because right. if you're not Christian friendly, the Christians will take their business somewhere else. Right. But you know what? There's no price to be paid for being an enemy to Christians because Christians won't stand up. Christians won't fight. Christians cave like a cheap tent all the time. No matter what the world throws at us, we still support them. But they have learned that the way you control people is that you do these things. And our response is, well, we're just going to pray for them. Mm -hmm. And there you go right back in line. But if we ever, if we ever decide, I've said it for years, if we, it, it, it won't take but one Christmas, just one, just one, for, for if the Christians would just say, you know what, you know what, you know what, as Christians, we don't celebrate the holidays. We celebrate the birth of Christ. And if you're not going to celebrate the birth of Christ, no problem. We, we, we are not going to, we're not going to bur burglarize your business. We're not going to stage a, we're not going to get out there and march. We're not going to break any glass. We're not going to steal anything. We're just not going to. We're just not going to show up. We're just not going to uh, shop. That We're just not going to do it. We're going to take our money. You know what we're going to do? We're going to take our money and keep it. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be better off December the 26th anyway. Anyway. You have more money. You have more money. Do this one time. One time. You know what? They will, on July the 4th, start running uh, Merry Christmas commercials. Matter of fact, we'd have to tell them, to, uh, you know what, uh, we, we got it, ease off. But because we do not fight, we are living in a society that is so wicked that now, they used to, you know, wait till late at night. You had to be up at 3 a.m. in the morning. Now, prime time, they show sitcoms and commercials featuring same-sex couples, men kissing men, women with women. They don't care if your children see it. Disney is one of the largest promoters of this wickedness. It's everywhere. And, and, and let me tell you something. If you, are, if you are in tune with God, if you're in tune with God and you see these things, it can overwhelm you. It can overwhelm. David, let me wrap this up now. David was overwhelmed, overwhelmed, praise the Lord. And so uh, in his weakened state, the pressure getting the better of him, praise the Lord. We find him having uh, wrote this psalm. If you would turn right quick, oh, that's just the Bible says so much. And, and, and I hear you out there. Well, preach, you can't preach the whole Bible in one sermon. I know it. I know it. But I sure do try. Psalms 142 says, David says, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. And with my voice unto the Lord, I did make my supplication. I prayed my specific prayer. I poured out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knowest my path in the way wherein I walk. Have, I, have they privately laid a snare for me? It says they, they've come against me. They've, they've worked against me. They've set traps against me. I, I looked on my right hand and, and behold, but there was no man that would know me. You see that? Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. You know he's going through. I cried unto thee, O Lord, I said, thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Attend unto my cry, for I am brought very low. You see that? Deliver me from my persecutors, for they 
are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison that I may praise thy name. The righteous shall compass me about for, though, for thou shalt deal bountifully. Say, so you are going to deal bountifully with me. I thank God that even in closing the song, he, he says to the Lord that God is going to render good my way at some point. But you see in this psalm that he is clearly overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. With David being overwhelmed, praise the Lord, he knew that he was unable to climb higher by himself. It's one of the things you got to know that... Uh, uh, when you can't do it by yourself. Physically, Deacon Miller, he was too weak to climb up the mountain to get to Mount Zion. Remember, he was out in, he was away from the tabernacle. Physically, the trip was too much. Spiritually, he was too weak to get back into that strong spiritual place. And mentally, too fatigued to figure out what this was all about on his own. I'm talking about searching the place of meaning. He couldn't, uh, Brother Wilson, fight his way out of this one. You know, he beat Goliath, but uh, a sling and a stone wouldn't work with this battle. With his bare hands, he defeated the lion and the bear. But neither, his hands uh, couldn't help him in this one. Yes, Brother Clarence, he was a skillful musician, but he couldn't play his way out of this situation. Music wouldn't help him. And, and uh, even though he was a seer, he couldn't see his way out of this one. God Almighty, but thank God that there was something that he could do. There's always something that won't fail us. Can't fight my way out, can't climb my way out, can't see my way out, can't play my way out. But that was one thing that you couldn't take away from it. David said, I can pray my way out of this. Somebody ought to shout something to the Lord. Have you ever been in a situation where everything failed? And all you had left was prayer. David prayed and said in uh, verse 2, the C clause, he said, lead me. You ought, to, you ought to look up toward heaven and tell God, lead me. Oh, I can't get myself out of this one, Lord. Lead me there, guide me. Lead me means guide me. It means transport me. It means go before me. You know, sometimes the Lord will guide us out. Sometimes the Lord has to just pick us up and transport us out of there. Sometimes he has to be like that pillar of cloud by day and the pillar uh, of fire by night. Exodus 13 and 21 says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud and led them uh, the way, and by night a pillar of fire. And gave them light <laughs> to go day by day, to go by go day by day and night to continue on in the work of the Lord. The Lord told me to tell you to pray today, lead me. Somebody's got a heavy burden on their heart. Somebody's child have gone astray. Someone's husband is acting the fool. Somebody's money is funny and the change is strange. Somebody's going through some things in their minds. Some of you, praise the Lord, have fallen. But I want you to know today that God is able to lead you out. The question is, uh, lead me. But then I heard him, somebody asked the question, lead me where? <laughs> and lead me to whom? Where, where, where can I go to find answers? Where can I go to find a solution? Well, let me tell you where you can't go. You can't go to the Book of Mormon. You can't go to the Quran. You can't go to yoga. You, you, you can't go to the ABC store. 
good God almighty, you can't go, oh Lord, to the crack house. Mm, you can't go to any of these man-made places because man's wisdom, man's philosophy, man's doctrines, man's treatments can only take you but so far. But there are some things that could happen that's beyond man's antidotes, that's beyond human solutions. There are some things that only God can handle. Oh Lord, have you ever had a God problem? A problem that was too big, too big for your mother. Problem that was too big, too big for your father. Woo, Lord. Too big, your friends didn't understand. A voice in your head that wouldn't stop talking, saying, kill yourself, kill yourself, kill yourself. You need, you need something stronger than a handshake. You need something stronger than somebody telling you that it's going to be all right. Oh, Lord, uh, there have been men standing looking in the mirror the mirror shows them the reflection of their whole who whole anatomy everything they see is a man in the mirror but there's a voice in their head that's saying you a woman you're a woman you're a woman oh you need somebody you need something stronger than the man-made remedy hey lord hey have you ever ah, been down everything is going well but you're still unhappy everything is working out right but there's still a low there's a weight there's a there's a depression in your life you need you need god to help you you read self-help books you read zig ziglar you read this one and that one you've you've used the sports metaphors and all that other stuff you said when the going gets tough the tough get going but none of that stuff worked because the load is so heavy i'm glad that when life load gets too heavy i'm glad when man-made antidotes seem to fail there is a place that you can turn who will never let you down there is someone who is able to bring you out you just got to keep on praying and you just got to wait on him i heard the songwriter say where do i go oh lord how do i go when there's no foundation stable who do i talk to when no one seems to listen who do i lean on in the time of tribulation he said i go to the rock the rock of my salvation i turn to the stone that the bill rejected oh, I turned to the mountain and I said mountain cleft for me when the world all around me is sinking sand on Christ the solid rock I stand when I need a shelter when I need a friend the rock that rock is Jesus 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 oh, yeah. somebody praise the Lord somebody praise him he said he said, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. 
The rock that is higher than I is God himself. In other words, David was saying, somebody's coming to the altar today. David was saying, let me get back into your presence. I don't need to physically be in Jerusalem. I just need to get in your presence. If I get in your presence, everything will be all right. In your presence, I can find meaning. Your presence will make sense of the situation. Your presence will make sense out of chaos. Your presence will give me power to go through it. Moses said, Lord, if your presence go not with us, then don't take us away from this place. The, the Bible said in Psalm 16 and verse 11, hallelujah, said thou will show me the path of life, for in thy presence is the fullness of joy, and at thy right hand pleasures forevermore. The power is in the presence of the Lord. While you're here, you ought to lift your hands and you ought to praise him and say, Lord, oh Lord, put me back in your presence. Give me your presence. You ain't got to solve the problem. I just need your presence. You don't have to fix it right now. I just need your presence. You don't have to make it right. I need, I need your presence. Your presence gives it meaning. Your presence helps me understand. Your presence lets me know that even though Tasha is not downstairs in that hospital bed, his presence shows you that she's somewhere around the throne. Yeah! Oh! Y'all ought to help me. Praise the Lord. say I can make it now I can make it now I'm in this presence and, and let me tell you what David said and I'm gonna watch this we're going home I got to go do granddaddy duty David David said David said this David said I, I know the work I know lead me to the rock that's higher than I will work how, how do you know David he said let me give you a history lesson he said for thou has been. You ought to look back and just see what the Lord has been. Oh, oh, when I look back over my life, he's been there every time. He's seen me through. He picked me up. He said, you've been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. That is, you've been my source of strength. Then I heard him give his declaration of faith to the Lord. Since you've been my source of strength in times past, he says, I will. I don't blame him. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covered of thy wings. When you talk about God's wings, wings is God's protection. He says, I will trust in your ability to protect me. Based on what you've done, Ebenezer, based on what you've done in my life, up until now. Hallelujah. And then he says something. You, you won't shout, but you order. Hallelujah. I, I, I sat back in my chair when I was doing my preparation yesterday. When I saw this, I, I just sat back and threw my hands up. Praise the Lord. I, woo, 
he says in, in verse uh, 5, he says, For thou, O God, hast heard my vows. Thou hast given me the heritage of those that fear me. When the Lord talks to you about a heritage, you know what God is telling you? He's telling you that you have a future. He's telling you, he's telling you that this ain't it. That you have not reached the end of the line. But you have something else to live for. Right here, I want you to praise the Lord like you have something else to live for. I have a future 